Um, I guess we can start. So, do you have any questions about anything from last time? How to access GitLab? Anything about version control? Anything? No? Okay, uh, again, we, yeah, go ahead. You have to save all your vectors when you create them in like a certain way. Do you like, have to create like all in your... a certain order or something like that? Or? Uh, in a certain order. When you create the data file? Right, right. Okay, so the question is, do you have... When you create your data file for visualization, do you have to save your vector in a certain format? Um, yeah, uh, you can. Or there's two ways you can do this. When you save the data file, you either store it as UVW, right? And it goes one after the other. Or you can save them as independent scalars. So scalar U, scalar V, scalar W. And then you can use the calculator to combine them any way you want. Right? So there's both ways. The second way is a bit more, it will take a bit more time because you have to do this processing. Uh, but yeah, you can do either way. Okay. Any other question? Okay. So we have started talking about numerical error and how these errors grow or they decrease over time. And this is actually a very relevant issue. You know, whenever you do a simulation, you, sometimes you might see that ah, my results are useless. They're, the numbers are 1E36 or something like that. And if you just change the time step, if you decrease your time step by 10 times or 100 times, you'll see, okay, now you get reasonable results. And we'll see today why that happens. What are some good fixes for these issues? So we started talking about this thing called the amplification amplification vector last time, uh, which is basically the ratio of the error at some node i at time step n plus one over time step n. So this is basically, this ratio basically tells me how the error changes in time at one specific node. Okay, and then we said that we can guarantee that we are, that our scheme is stable if this condition holds. Um, so this is just basically saying that as we step forward in time, the error keeps decreasing. And um, today we can take a look at how exactly uh, this translates to what the time step should be. Okay. So if you remember, we were talking about, again, the linear heat equation. And let me change kappa to alpha. Okay. Just because we will use kappa as another variable. So this is, again, the same thing. This is diffusivity or conductivity. And we also know that a good way to discretize this is um, T i n plus 1 by C i n I plus 1. If you see a mistake, tell me. I, was, I would write a lot of T i is 50. So that we already know. Right? We've seen that in the previous two classes. If anything's unfamiliar, stop me. So we also said that, OK, since this is an approximation, when we solve this, the answer will not be the exact solution to this continuous PDE. Right? There will be some error. So what that means is uh, this epsilon is actually the true solution, true exact solution, minus the numerical solution. 
And that is one definition of error. We can have other definitions. But this is a very simple definition, which we will stick with uh, for today. So let me give this uh, a name. Let's say this true exact solution is T. Okay? And this numerical solution we would represent as E, let's say T what? T hat, T tilde, let me check. Um, let's call it, yeah, T tilde. Okay? So, after we solve this discretized PD, the answer that we get, we will call T tilde. And the error is just difference. So, we know this T tilde that should satisfy this discretized equation, right? Because that's how we got to T tilde by solving this discretized equation. So, uh, let me just regroup this T n i equal uh, T i n minus epsilon i. Okay? So, I'm going, just going to plug this T tilde in there. Then we call this A. <coughs> So what we get is, uh, let me see, T tilde I N should satisfy the discretized equation. All right, so let's make it satisfy the discretized equation. So this just becomes uh, T i tilde n plus 1 times T i tilde n over delta T equal alpha and blah blah blah. So that's just the whole thing. We replace all the T's with T tilde. Now, if we just expand out this T tilde, we get T i n plus 1 plus epsilon i n plus 1. Okay, that's just this first t tilde that expanded minus t i n plus epsilon i n is the second t tilde that expanded delta t equal alpha and again we we can expand this on the right hand side. Okay, this nothing fancy happening here. And now we can start grouping this. So we have T i n plus 1 minus T i n over delta T plus epsilon i n minus 1 uh, plus 1 minus epsilon i n over delta T equal blah, blah, blah on the right hand side. So this we will call our B. So now you, you will notice that we basically have the T terms separate and the epsilon terms separate. And if we go back to our A, if we subtract this whole A from our B, the only thing we will left with, we will be left with is the epsilon terms. So let's do that. So when we do B minus A, this gives us epsilon I n plus one, epsilon I n over delta T equal alpha um, epsilon i plus 1 n minus 2. Delta x squared. Okay, so now what does this tell you? What, what can you, you know, intuitively say? Okay, we, we, we derived this a minus b, but what does this mean? This means that epsilon follows this discretized equation. What can you tell me in terms of the continuous equation that epsilon should follow? Take a guess. Does this tell us anything about how epsilon should change in time? How it should evolve in time? What does this discretized equation remind you of? Uh, 
Come on. Quick. Quick, quick. Okay, so let's let's just speed it up. It's something to the n plus one minus something to the n over z that e. This looks like what derivative? Spatial derivative, the second derivative. The time. The time derivative. The time derivative. Right? So that the left hand side would be equivalent to del epsilon over del t. Right? Now tell me, what will the right hand side be equivalent to? Central difference for discretization for a space. All right. Uh, it is the center difference discretization for a space derivative. Which derivative? Third derivative, fourth derivative? Second. Second. Second derivative, right? So this is just alpha del 2 epsilon over del x squared. So we haven't done anything fancy. Okay? We just did some addition and subtraction to realize that our error will follow the same law uh, that the original PDE follows, right? And this is this is a this is a very nice elegant solution, which you will not get all the time. If your PDE is nonlinear, or you define your epsilon to be square root of difference squared, then you might not get this clean answer. Okay. But for for us, this is this is a good thing. So now, um, do you, are you guys familiar with what a Fourier series is? Have you heard of the term before? Yeah. Okay. So you've heard of it. So what the Fourier series is basically. Any smooth function um, let's call it f of let's say the variable is x can be represented as a linear combination of of what? Sine and cos. Of sines and cosines. So yeah, that's, that's a very nice proof about it. Um, but if you have an infinite number of smooth sinusoids, you can basically combine them in a very specific way to recreate any smooth function. That's what the Fourier series says. So in mathematically, we write it as follows. fx is summation n equals 0 to infinity, some coefficient an, cosine n phi x over l plus en sine n phi x over l. Okay. So this, this is just saying the same thing mathematically that my fx can be represented as an infinite sum of sines and cosines. And there's a nicer way to represent this. If you remember, e to the i theta is what? Do you remember? <coughs> it's a cosine theta yeah. plus i sine. Exactly, so it's cosine theta plus i sine theta, okay? So there is, we can just rewrite this long thing as f of x equals summation n equals zero to infinity e to the i kappa x. So now this kappa is called the wave number. Typically, it just means it's the uh, frequency in space. So we're all familiar with frequency in time, right? When something vibrates, we know how to compute the frequency. When we listen to music, we have high frequency components and low frequency components. If we just think of this decomposition in space instead of time, this frequency is called wave number. Okay. All right, so any f of x can be represented as an infinite sum of i, k, there's an n here, about n, x. 
Okay. All right. So let's assume that our epsilon can do the same. Right? It can be represented as an infinite sum of these exponentials. And we will take, instead of this infinite sum, we will just take this term, right? Which is me taking one particular mode, one particular, uh, yeah, it's called a mode. And for any general kappa, okay? And then we will see how this mode grows or decays in time. Does, does everything make sense up to this point? Okay. Please ask me if some anything is confusing. Okay. So let's take let's take a general Fourier mode of the error and let's and let's say such that the epsilon x comma t is represented as e to the i kappa x. Okay, and again, kappa is a general kappa. Yeah. Oh, uh, right. Something's missing, right? It, this, what's missing? Epsilon should be a function of space mm -hmm. and time, but on the right hand side, I only have a space term. So let's say there's a gt, uh, any uh, function, which we will find right now, uh, that's only dependent on time. Okay? So how do we find gt? Do you, can you take a guess on how we can find this gt? Hint is, take a look at the governing TDE for epsilon. be the left side of the equation. So Alex says it's going to be the left side. So wait, what do you mean? Uh, so we have, okay, let me rewrite the governing equation here. Del S on del T equals alpha del L. Okay, so you're saying this should be, what should be the left side? Uh, it, it just has the T term, so that's on. Ah, yeah, so yeah, well, where you're going is correct. So there's a t term and an independent x term, right? Mm -hmm. So the derivative on the left side will only apply to the gt. Okay? This will be treated as a constant. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that, that's how we should find out what gt is. So this means that del of gt e i k x over del t is alpha del to g t e i k x or del x squared. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I will let you tell me what the left hand side becomes. What, what should I write? We're just differentiating this term. <coughs> G prime. G prime T times IKX. Right. So the IKX is the independent of T, so it's treated as a constant because we're doing a partial derivative. Equal. GT. <coughs> GT. Yes. Then? IK squared. IK squared. Times E to the IKX. E to the IKX. So, yeah. <coughs> what you told me is basically now this is treated as constant because we're differentiating with respect to x. So, I take it out and E to the IKX. The second derivative is just this thing. Right? And I squared is minus 1. So, it's just minus alpha K squared E to the IKX. GT. And on the left hand side we have this. Okay, so we will cancel this e to the i k x and now we have g prime t over gt equals 
equal a constant. Okay, and we know how to integrate this, right? Um, when we integrate this with respect to dp, we get log of dp equal minus alpha k squared t. Okay, which gives me g of t is exponential minus a k squared t. So, and there's a constant, but we don't care. So, we've found what this time dependent function should be. And what this is telling us that in time, the amplitude of the error should either grow in indefinitely or it should shrink. Like either grow or decrease exponentially, right? That's what it's telling us. So now we can write our full epsilon. <coughs> we said it was gt e to the i k x, which now we know is minus a k square t e to the i k x. Make sense? Okay. So this was a nice derivation on the side, but we, we st we're still nowhere close to figuring out what stability means in terms of time stepping. All right, so for that, let us plug this expression back into our discretized PDE. So discretized PDE form is just again epsilon uh, i n plus one minus epsilon i n alpha epsilon i plus one n minus two epsilon i n plus epsilon i minus one n over delta x one right so let's <coughs> Plug the epsilon x comma t here. Okay. Everything good up till now. No confusion. Okay. Should I slow down? Speed up? You get pace. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So let's. Plug this epsilon, which we derived here, in this uh, PDE. So what happens is, uh, I will let you tell me, what, what is the first term here become in, in terms of this e to the whatever, times e to the whatever? What should <coughs> epsilon i n plus 1 be written as? T plus delta t. Yeah, t should become t plus delta t because if time step is n plus one, which means t is t plus delta t. All right. So let's see. This becomes e to the minus k k squared t plus delta t, and the other uh, s term does not change. Minus <coughs> e i n is the whole thing which is e to the minus k to k squared t and k x over delta t. Okay. So I don't have space. So this is the left hand side. Left hand side. Right. What is the right hand side difference? Alpha, uh, let me take the delta x squared out here. Okay, let me fill it in. So, first term is epsilon e to the i plus 1 n. What will this be? So, 
So I'm trying to replace this with something that looks like this. X plus delta. What's what? X plus uh, delta x. All right. So since it's i plus 1 now, this x should become x plus delta x. Time should not change because this is n. Right? So. Um, You have a common factor, I think, uh, e to the negative alpha is constant, so for all. Yeah, uh, I can do that to make my life easier. See, all of these are e to the n, e to the n, e to the n, epsilon to the n. So this e to the minus a k square t is com common for all those three. That's that's exactly what I'm going to say. So I can take that out to make my life a little easier minus alpha k square t. And then, now I can do the x plus delta x, x minus delta x, as f is in. So the first term becomes e to the i k, x plus delta x, minus 2 times e to the i k x. And the last one is. So that's the right hand side. This, this term expanded out. All right, so now there's more common terms here, right? This is an ikx, 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 and all three terms. I can take that out as well, and I can do the same on the left hand side. So let me clean out everything a bit. So this becomes e to the minus k k squared t times e to the i k x um, over delta t. <coughs> and inside, we're left with e to the minus k k squared delta t minus 1. This is the left hand side, right? Can you move it up a little bit? Oh, yeah. Uh, This is again the left hand side equal alpha over delta x squared. I'm just rewriting the whole expression in a, by uh, taking all the common terms together. Okay. Times what remains inside is i k delta x minus 2 e to minus i uh, uh, that e to minus i k delta x. Okay, and this is the left hand side and this is the right hand side. Alright, so let's cancel things. So this cancels this, this cancels this. So what I have now is e to the minus a k square delta, delta t minus 1 equal alpha delta t over delta x squared times We have this sort of laborious expression. What should we do with it? How, how do we go from here to our stability criteria? Mm. So again, what was the stability criteria? It was just epsilon i n plus 1 over epsilon i n. Modulus should be less than 1, right? What, what does this imply in terms of e to the i's? If I write this epsilon in terms of the exponentials, what should what will it become? E to the delta t. Right. Or, or t. Um, 
T plus delta T. Right, right. right. So the numerator here is just E to the minus alpha delta T plus delta T. Mm -hmm. And the other one unchanged. Over. Uh, the exponentials, the original one, e minus, is it squared? Yeah. So here, t times e to the i k. Okay. So this should be less than one. Uh, let's cancel things again. This cancels that. This cancels that. Which means e to the minus alpha delta squared delta t modulo should be less than one. Okay? So this is condition for stability. Alright, so let's see. Now we have this equation. Uh, and we basically have this this term that we are looking for, e to the minus ak squared delta t. So, from this we call this c, so c implies uh, 1 uh, plus alpha delta t over delta x squared and this whole thing inside e to the i k delta x minus 2 plus e minus i k should be less than 1. Again, this is a long procedure but we're not doing anything strange. We're just doing some algebra step by step. So it should be less than 1 for a stable solution. Again, everything makes sense up to now? Okay, now we are very close. We are on about two steps away from getting our condition on delta t. So, towards the beginning, you had told me that e to the i theta is, I can write as cos theta plus i sine theta, right? Okay? which implies um, e to the i k delta x can be written as cos k delta x plus i sine k delta x. Okay? And what this means is this term inside we will just <coughs> become And so x becomes uh, this is cosine that will become a minus sign. So we will have two cosine k delta x minus two. Fine. So let's go back to our stability condition. So one plus alpha delta t over delta x squared times 2 cosine k delta x minus 2 should be less than 1. Proof. Okay, so um, there's a short way of doing this and there's a long way of doing this. Short way, we just uh, remember that recall 1 minus cos theta is just uh, 2 sine squared theta over 2, right? Which implies we have inside 1 minus times minus 2 sine squared theta over 2 should be less than 1. Okay. okay, so we are 
at the answer now, which is true alpha delta t for delta x squared sine squared theta over 2 should be less than 1. Okay. So everything makes sense? So tell me now, when is this condition satisfied? What do you know about sines and cosines? Sine squared theta two can be only between. <coughs> yeah, this term can only be between zero and one. This is uh, between zero and one. Okay. Maximum it can be is one, and we're saying that one minus this term should be less than one. Right? This cannot be negative. Neither of these can be negative. This cannot be negative either. Okay, this is greater than zero. Because alpha is diffusivity. Physically, diffusivity should not be negative. Delta E, we're stepping forward in time. Delta X, again, negative. Delta X doesn't make sense. Okay. So both these terms are positive, and we know this is less than 1. So what's the condition on this thing? Between 0 and 1? Yeah. Uh, uh, it should be theta is k delta x, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yes. Um, all right. So, uh, so, this is k delta x is k delta x. Thank you. There should be an extra 2 multiplied to it. Uh, where? Um, the original term is 2 cos, uh, 2 into cos theta minus 1. It's, uh, yeah, the, yes, yes. So there's, there's this 2, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So that is from the two. Uh, okay, 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 wait, wait, I think I messed up something. Uh, cos, yeah, so 2 goes here first and what did I do? What did I do? Two four. Yeah, four, yes. But is that correct? Two, three, two. Give me one second, okay? Or two number is the formula correct? One minus cos theta is that? Yes, yes. Okay, I am missing a two number, so let's do it the other way. Uh, so let me cross this whole thing out. I need. Okay, I need to check this. But there's another way we can do this. You can, it's what you were saying, it's 1 plus 2 alpha delta t over delta x squared. And inside what remains is plus k delta x minus 1. Should be less than 1. Okay. Is there a minus missing? No. no. Alright, perfect. So, we can work with this. So, Cos k delta x minus 1. Let's draw a graph. Okay, so we know if we have cosine k delta x, it should be, should go from, from there. Between 0 and 1. Um, from minus, minus 1 to plus 1. one. Any, any sinusoid was from plus 1 to minus 1. The average is. Right? So cosine 0 is 1, and then you go all the way to minus 1, and then you go here. Okay? That's what a cosine curve looks like. Okay? So, uh, so, and this is 
y equals 1, 0, minus 1. Make sense? All right, so which means this whole thing gets shifted down because of this minus 1. So my cosine goes from this is for cosine k delta x minus 1. Okay. So maximum here is 0. Minimum here is minus 2. So let's let's look at our stability condition. If it's let's look at maximum. So if it's this whole thing is zero, this is one plus zero, which fine, it does not violate stability. Let's look at the worst case condition. Worst case condition is if this bracket is minus two, then I have to make sure that this second term does not make this go negative uh, or does not make this two negative such that the magnitude becomes larger than one, right? Is that confusing? Okay. Um, so for worst case scenario is that cosine k delta x minus 1 is minus 2, okay? So in that case, what this gives us is 1 plus 2 alpha delta t or delta x squared times minus 2 should be less than 1. Okay. And uh, we can say that this condition is satisfied if 2 alpha delta t over x squared is less than 1. Does that make sense? Ah. So let's, let's, let's just Take a look. Uh, so let's say if this is this is larger than one, then we would have one minus let's say this one. Okay. One minus two, one plus two times minus two would be three, right? That violates this condition. If this is smaller than one, let's say zero point five, we would have one plus zero point five times minus two, which is zero. Fine. That condition is satisfied. Let's say this is one. Okay. If this is 1, we have 1 minus 2, which is 1. So, again, this is good. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for this stability condition to be satisfied, we need this uh, condition on alpha delta t over. So, now we have our condition on delta t is delta x squared uh, over 2 alpha. It's a necessary condition for stability. For stability of what? Any equation? Burger's equation? Are we Schultz equation? For this particular equation, the heat equation, right? We are looking currently only at the heat equation. With this particular discretization, I will show you that this does not follow if we change the discretization. Okay? So with this very uh, simple discretization that uh, we have the time derivative and we take the standard difference for the second derivative, this 
condition should always hold, otherwise your solution will blow up. So uh, this uh, depends, if you notice here, delta B depends on your delta X. So if you take much finer grid sizes, what happens to your delta B? So instead of taking 10 points on the grid, you take 100 points. What should you do with your delta B? Decrease it. Yeah, you would need to decrease delta B by 100 times, right? You see, it's a delta X squared. So this is a very restrictive condition, especially because it's a delta X squared. I can, I would, I might want to work on finer grids, but then the time steps I would have to take would be very, very small. Okay. So this is a drawback of. Time setting. Okay. It's a very simple formulation. Again, that, that's that's all we need. But this is a very big drawback. Do you know some ways to get rid of this drawback? This limitation. Have you heard of something called implicit scheme? Okay, so most of you have not, which is awesome because we will talk about that now. One solution is use implicit time stepping. Uh, so let me bring back our differential equation. <coughs> and this drives left hand side as we have always done. But now on the right hand side, instead of using Epsilon at time level n, I can use epsilon at time level n plus 1. So I would write over the here. Mm -hmm. Let's compare this to what we had earlier. So this is our old expression. The only difference now that you see is this, instead of epsilon n's, we have epsilon n plus 1. Okay? And this is a valid way of discretizing our equation. What is the drawback? Nothing comes from for free. Everything, every improvement you make costs something. What is the drawback here? of doing this. We don't know what, we, we need information yeah. in the next steps. Yeah, exactly. We need this, we need to know what this epsilon or t, the, what the value is at the next time step, which is what we are trying to solve. So we don't know what it is. Okay. So then this is where we would need to solve a system of equations. And I will show you an example. But first, do you believe me that using implicit time stepping gets rid of this problem? What should we do to make sure that that happens? How do you figure out the stability of a discretized equation? Then go back to the same. Yeah, we, we do what we just did, right? So, by the way, this is called uh, von Neumann stability analysis. This is the simplest way of analyzing the stability of PDs. So, let's repeat our P 
it with again uh, x on equal e to the minus a k square e e to the i k x. Okay, and this time we will go a bit faster because we've already seen the individual steps. Okay, so and uh, we're going through this derivation because. Once you know that where all these conditions come from, then you never have to do this again. You, know? so you, you can always remember, ah, okay, I, I need to satisfy this condition for this reason. So now we will go much faster and n plus 1 minus n. So this will just become the same as before, k, k squared t times e i k x. And inside, what do we have? <coughs> Yes? Um, e to the negative alpha k squared delta t. Yeah, perfect. Minus, minus 8 one. k squared delta t minus 1. Minus one. Yeah. And on the right hand side, we have an alpha over delta x squared. Um, and let me also again see all the three terms have. The, the common thing is n plus 1. So I can take out e to the minus k squared t plus delta t. And there is an i plus i, i minus 1. So another common term, I can take out the e to the i k x. What remains inside is? <coughs> E to the i k x delta or delta x. E to the i k delta x minus two minus two plus e to the negative i k delta x. Yeah. So again, we haven't done anything classic. We've just expanded out this in terms of the the analytical expression. Okay. So. <laughs> Let's again cancel common things out. This is common to that, and this is common to this. So let's clean the expression. It's e to the minus a k squared delta t <clears throat> minus one equal alpha delta t over delta x squared times e to the minus 8k squared delta t times, then you call this beta, right? Beta is the same thing as here. What's in the parentheses here was it's called beta, all right? So rearrange this, we just get e minus 8k squared delta t times um, 1 minus Alpha delta t of delta x squared beta equal plus one. Okay, and we derived earlier that for stability, this should be less than one. Okay, which means now I have my condition that I can okay. Everything makes sense? Nothing is confusing? Okay, so this now is the stability criterion for when we take the right hand side at n plus one, not at n. Okay? So what, what is this beta? Beta is uh, what I said was e i k delta x minus two plus e i minus i k delta x, which we derived is the same as saying this is two cos k delta x minus two. All right. Um, Okay, so now tell me, can you tell me what the stability condition simplifies to?
This is just saying that 1 over this whole thing should be less than 1, which means 1 minus this whole thing should be greater than 1, right? Should be greater than 1. Okay, is that the case? Let's see. Um, okay, can you just make sure I didn't mess up again? Nope, I did not mess up. Perfect. Ah, okay. So, now, let's see. Let's draw the graph for this beta. So, this is uh, between. This goes between two times plus minus one, so this goes between zero and minus two. This is two cos k delta x of minus two. Okay. If you just take out the two cosine k delta x minus one, would be go from zero to minus one, and then you multiply the whole thing by two, so the whole thing becomes zero to minus two. So, is this condition satisfied? As long as beta isn't zero. As long as the beta is less than zero, this condition is always satisfied, right? And we just drew the graph for beta. It is always the, the graph. The graph drawn is for cos k delta x minus one. Uh, no, there's a uh, ah so. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. So this should be minus 2 and minus 4, right? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So yeah, uh, if you if you draw cos k delta x minus 1, it will go from 0 to minus 2. And then we multiply the whole thing, it goes from 0 to minus 2. Okay, thank you. So our graph says that it's always negative, and we you know this thing inside should be positive, and beta is always negative, so this condition is always satisfied, no matter what delta t you take. No matter what delta t you pick, it's unconditionally stable. Okay, so just by changing one very small thing, we have gone from having all these stability issues and taking very small time steps to being unconditionally stable. No matter what delta t we pick, our solution will converge to an answer. Can we pick delta t to be whatever we want? 100 or 10 instead of 0 0.1? Will it not affect our solution in any way? It will affect the solution, but not the stability. Exactly. We will get a stable solution, but it might not be an accurate solution. You always have to take care that you sort of uh, are able to capture the physical time scales with this delta t that you take. For instance, a vortex rotation time period is something. You want to make sure that your the delta t you take can capture that. Okay. So, stability is not the same as accuracy. All right, so this is a very uh, nice thing to have in the scheme, but let's go back and look at the problems it causes. And, and you, you were telling me that, yeah, now we have things that we don't know on the right-hand side, right? This is the stable scheme. Oh. This is the stable scheme now, but then let's see how you solve this, again with a stable example that used a few days ago. So if you remember we had this rod which we discretized into five points, i going to one, two, three, four, five, we said, is there a question? 
and you see what I'm writing down. So we said that this goes from 100 degrees centigrade to 20, and x is 0 0.0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1. Okay? And then temperature, initial temperature, T0 is 100, 80, 60, 40, and 20. All right? Okay, so um, uh, we, we did all of this for epsilon, but the same thing applies for T. Uh, we can add T i n plus 1 minus T i n. T i plus 1 n plus 1. Over the next one. All right, so let's do this for i equal to. You tell me, what should I write? For i equal to, what will I have? What is my equation going to be? And n equals 0. n equals 0, let's say delta t is 0 0.1 and delta x is 0.25, right? So let's write out for i equal to what this discretized equation looks like. N minus N plus one and two minus. Um, or, or do you want to do the delta T in there? Yeah. Okay. Let's put the zero point one. Okay. Yeah. And then um, this you say this all is one. Okay. T one. Yes, that would be. Um, T one and zero, right? Which is uh, what's more? 80. 80, uh, yeah, it's 80. So it should be t, t at node 2 times 0, which is 80 equal, uh, what did I say alpha was? Alpha is 10. Okay, alpha is 10 over 0 0.25 whole squared. What goes on top? <coughs> T13. T13 minus 2, T12 plus T11. None of which are known. We don't know any of those. Okay, so this is exactly the problem you were telling me. Okay, how do we get around this? Do you know how, how we get around this? Yes. Have, yeah, have you seen this before? How? Tell me. So we guess, you know, we have some uh, initial guess for different, I think, T3, 2, and 1. Okay. And then, so we have a couple of uh, uh, equations that should satisfy for each of them. So you were saying, let's take a guess for what this, these yeah. numbers are? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that approach works for a very specific case. When you're, for instance, trying to get to a stable solution, a steady state solution. Okay. Uh, but for now, and that, that's a huge uh, approximation, right? What should I put the numbers down to be? They, they would basically be random numbers. Mm -hmm. So let's, we can try something more, uh, more like a, a step by step, but it will be costly. All right? Was there an answer from Bogarato? Uh, take the unknowns to the left hand side and write the equation for every uh, node. Right. So, and, yeah. As a system of linear equations, and then you can solve the system as a whole. Yeah. If you, have, you, if you know the boundary conditions. Okay. So, yeah. the answer is uh, everything that's unknown in this equation goes to one side, everything that's known goes to the other side. And then we will basically have a simultaneous set of equations that we can solve. All right, let's do that. So uh, let me not write any of the numbers. Let me stick to variables. So for um, yeah, I equal two, we basically have done this. Um, okay, let me first. 
introduce some one new variable to make my life a little easier. Alpha delta t over delta x squared times the whole thing inside. So let me call this in gamma. Okay. Um, and what then we have is um, T i n plus one minus gamma T i plus one n plus one. And on the right hand side, we only have one known term, which is T i n. I just re rewrote it, the, the original discretized equation in this form here, because it is mm -hmm. just e easier to write the equations now. So let's see. For i equal two, you get t two n plus one minus gamma t three n plus one. Yes, minus two t two. And we're doing this for any general t1 n plus 1 equal t n, right? What will I get for 3? Uh, easy answer, but tell me nonetheless. 3 n plus 1, 3. Yeah. T4 <coughs> minus 2 <coughs> to the 3 n plus 1. Plus t two n plus one t <clears> three. <throat> okay, and for the last one, I will uh, basically bring this together. So see, there's a t three and t three. These things are common. So let me say t four one plus two gamma, right? Right. Then there's a oh, there's an n no, n plus one. Then there's a minus gamma t five and plus one, and then there's a, 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 a wait did I mess something up? Uh, no, minus gamma t three and plus one equal t four n. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So I basically took this. Ti and Ti and minus. So we just have one minus one plus two gamma here. Right? Okay, so remember for i equal one and five, we don't need to solve anything because they're boundary conditions. They're given. If we write, rewrite this in terms of a matrix, what we get is so we have we have a T1, T2, T3. T4, T5, so all of these are present here. T1, N plus 1, T2, N plus 1, T2, N plus 1, T4, N plus 1, T5, N plus 1. And on the right side, we have T2, N, T3, T3, N, T4, N. Okay. Oh. Right? Okay, let's fill out the matrix. What goes here? Gamma. Minus gamma. gamma. Minus gamma because, yeah, exactly. So we have a minus gamma times T1 mm -hmm. in first equation. So we get a minus gamma. Then. Two gamma. Two gamma. Then. Minus gamma. So oh, minus. Um, sorry, for T2, it's oh, yeah. one minus right. two gamma. Or plus one. Yeah. Okay. Then. Minus gamma again, right? Mm -hmm. And then? No, four, zero. And zero, zero and zero. All right. Good. Everybody know what's happening? All right. So similarly for T2, you will have a zero mm -hmm. minus gamma, two gamma plus one, minus gamma, zero. And we have zero, zero minus gamma, two gamma plus one, and did I mess something up? Uh, I feel like I messed something up. Uh, minus gamma. Okay, there's a minus gamma here, yeah. But 
Can you see? Is everything okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So there's three rows and because we have uh, uh, Okay, so we have, we have this is a, a three by five matrix. This is a five by one matrix, so we need a three by one matrix. Yeah, all right, perfect, perfect. So, can, can I solve this system now? There's, there's one more thing that we, we can do to this system. Is this the unknown vector? So everything on the right hand side is known, everything in this matrix is known, but does this vector only can contain unknown values? So you know the boundary conditions. Yeah, it also contains our boundary conditions, right? There's a T1 n plus 1, there's a T5 n plus 1, which should not be here. We know these numbers, so we don't need to solve for them. So let's remove these to the right hand side by Rewriting our matrix. So our unknowns are T2 n plus 1, T3 n plus 1, T4 n plus 1. And on the right hand side, we add T2 n, T3 n, T4 n. OK, so let's see. What was known? So this T1 n plus 1 times minus gamma can go on the right side. This becomes plus gamma T one n plus one. This time this stays here, so we have a two gamma plus one. This times this stays here, so we have a minus gamma. This times this stays, so we have zero. Okay, help me fill out the second row. So uh, this is multiplied by this whole thing, so let's see. Uh, that times two, that times three, that times four, and zero times the others. So it's plus zero plus zero. Okay. Oh, I filled it out. I, okay, fine. Let me. You can help me fill out the third row. Two gamma plus one. All right. Then help me fill out the third row. What, what should I write here? Zero. Yeah. So it's uh, it, it's zero times that, which is. Zero. And minus what gamma. Uh, yeah, minus gamma times that when it goes to the right hand side becomes plus gamma times T five. Right? Mm -hmm. So everything here is still known and we have this unknown vector. Uh, what goes here? <coughs> zero. Yeah, so zero times T two, minus gamma times T three, and the last one is this times T four. The last one went on the other side. Gamma times T5 is now over here. Okay, so now we have A times B equals C. This is known. This is known. This is unknown. How do you solve this? <coughs> ah. Okay. This is the T's we are looking for, right? What is T at node 2, 3, and 4 at the next height. Okay, that's my vector B. E. Okay, so quick way of solving this? Inverse the multiply. Inverse. Matrix <laughs> inverse. A equals A inverse times C. Is this a good way to do this? Yes. This is a good way to do this for this particular problem where we have a 3 by 3 matrix. We know how to compute the inverse exactly. Okay, there's a formula. Imagine instead of discretizing with five points, I had it discretized with 100 points. The size of this matrix would be 98 by 98. Okay? And doing a straight inverse, uh, do you know what the hmm, cost of matrix inversion is? How it scales? Cost of matrix inversion. If you just do it uh, without using any special tricks, is order n cubed, okay? n is the number of elements on each side, if it's a square matrix. 
let's say a 10 by 10 matrix takes me one second to invert. How much would a 100 by 100 take? <coughs> Uh, I told you that the cost scales are n two. Yes. One thousand seconds. One thousand times. It, it will take one thousand seconds. It will be hundred over n cubed, which is one thousand seconds. Okay. So again, this is a very small problem. We have digitized our rod using a hundred points, and it will take me a, a thousand seconds just to go one step, which is terrible. I will wait for a few years before I get a solution. So. In numerics, you never actually do this matrix inversion. You use some uh, very clever techniques that we, people came up with. And I will tell you more about that next class. Uh, that's basically dealing with sparse matrices and tridiagonal matrices or pentadiagonal matrices. And you can solve this in order n instead of order n cubed, which is the best you can do. That's not the best, which is a very nice cost scaling to have. Okay, so uh, let me quickly recap what we did. We started with uh, stability of this thing, the, 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 the explicit time stepping scheme, and we figured out that it is stable only if this delta t is smaller than this condition. All right, this is the absolutely necessary stability condition. And then we look at, looked at the implicit time stepping scheme, which is somewhere here. Um, okay, I have lost it in my paper somewhere. So with the implicit time stepping scheme, what basically happened was Everything on the right side now is at n plus one. And we showed that this is unconditionally stable. No matter what delta t you take, you will get a solution. Okay? And we looked at what the what that this creates a problem. The problem being that if we do uh, an implicit time integration, we have to do this big matrix, uh, we have to solve this big system of equation, okay? Because the things we want are unknown. Um, so let me stop at that point, and then we will go on in the next class. So, um, again, whenever you have questions about the homework, about uh, how to set up the software, please just email me or come to my office. Um, OK, so yeah, we can stop. Yeah, I'm going to go to the right now. Uh,